in the last days. There will be three evil beings running the world system and they are called by three titles. I'll put them on the overhead for you. There they are. These three beings. First of all, we have that evil looking one in the middle there, Satan, taking the place of God the Father. There will be a man running the common market. His name is called Antichrist and he'll be your political man. And then we'll have a man called the false prophet and he will be running the world church. So you'll have three of them, a satanic trinity in these days. Now the word of God teaches us that there is a powerful spirit in the world today who is opening the way for them to come to power. Let's read together, shall we? In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 6, all the King James readers, read with me. And now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. The question is, what is stopping the mystery of iniquity from being revealed? First of all, what is the meaning of the mystery of iniquity? In the Word of God it says in the Amplified Bible, the mystery of iniquity or that hidden principle of rebellion against all constituted authority is already at work in the world today. And you will know that that spirit is being fostered by certain people who bring in laws in the education system like taking the cane out of schools for example. You see, if you sow the wind, you will reap the whirlwind. And uh, as I said the other night, a strap or a cane will do the job that 5,000 psychiatrists cannot do. When I was teaching down here at Beresford Street School, we had a special class, and I used to teach another class of people from the Pacific Islands. 89% of my kids were Pacific Island kids, and they didn't speak English very well. My job was to teach them. The special class had people with learning disabilities and so on, and some of them were really strange children. Whenever the teacher of that class had any problems, she'd bring them over to me, and I would take from my bag a very special friend. I'll show you. And with this friend of mine, I would assist their learning process. There it is. And I found that pretty well everybody became normal once receiving a bit of that. Very surprising. There's no talk needed. The children feel better when they have something like that because it is recommended in the Word of God. In the book of Proverbs, if you don't read it, the wisest man in the world's name was Solomon. Chapter 22 and verse 15, Proverbs, he said these words. Train up, sorry, he said, a foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction will drive it far from him. Now the funny thing about the, the policy that the government is bringing in at the moment is as follows. They take away the strap where you would whack children on the bottom or the hand, but they leave the police armed with long battens to wrap them over the skull later on. And I say it would be better to whack them on the bottom with a soft strap rather than a club over the head later and break their skulls. Very inconsistent. Now let's move on, shall we? We notice then that these three beings are going to come to power, but there is something stopping them, and the question is, what is stopping the rise of the mystery of iniquity? Some people tell me that the Christians who are known as the Bride of Christ are that force which is stopping the Antichrist from being revealed. They say that once Jesus comes back for his bride, the Christians, the bride goes up and then all evil breaks loose on the earth. Well, I do admit that the bride is a very powerful stabilizing force and I say, thank God for every born again believer. That's great. One morning we were crossing the Sydney Harbour Bridge and the family were all with me and as we went across it, some of you know Sydney Harbour Bridge? It's just, it's just, the traffic is just flat out all the time. Two speeds, flat out and stop. And uh, we were going over on a Sunday morning, everything was very quiet on Sunday morning. I said to the family, do you know why everything's quiet on Sunday morning? They said, no dad. I said, all the devils are in bed sleeping off Saturday night. That's true, you know. Everything's very quiet Sunday morning. Have you ever noticed when you come to church? All the devils are in bed, you see. Champagne at night, real pain in the morning. Now. <laughs> and so we notice then that the bride of Christ is a very powerful stabilizing force in the world today. When the Christians are gone, it will take away the salt of the earth. Everything will go rotten. That is true, but we are not the uh, restraining force. Some people tell me that it is the Holy Spirit that is the restraining force. They teach us that when the Lord Jesus Christ comes, and I teach uh, before the three and a half years of tribulation, they say that the Holy Spirit will also go up with Jesus. I do not agree with that. And the reason is that people are going to be converted during the tribulation period. 
In the book of Revelation chapter 7, it says these words, that a number of people dressed in white robes will get up to heaven, and one will say, what are these that are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? Which in simple English means, who are these people with white robes on? Where did they come from? And the answer is given, these are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. In other words, there are going to be people saved during the tribulation. If you have loved ones who do not get saved in these meetings, as long as they come to the meeting, that's the main thing, and when it all happens, they will never forget what they heard in these meetings and they can still get saved during the tribulation. The, the, the only difficult portion is this, they will get to heaven, but they will go minus their heads. Now we read the next bit. We notice that there is something else which is restraining, and that is Antichrist himself. Reading the writings of Dr. Ivan Pannon of Bible Numerics fame, he says these words. He says, if you read in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 6, you will find the meaning of verse 7. Let's read it again, shall we? Here we go. And now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. If you look that up in the Amplified Bible, it says, in his own appointed time. In other words, the Antichrist is alive on earth tonight. He is a Jewish man. We have established that. He is so in touch with Lucifer or Satan that they actually have a, a chain of communication. They talk to each other. I don't know a few people in New Zealand here know this, but in New Zealand we have a group called the Church of Satan. Did you know that certain people actually talk to Satan? Did you know there was a woman written a book who actually married Satan? They walked into the fire together, both of them, and they weren't burned. Satan and this human woman walked into a fire together. Did you know in certain parts of New Zealand and Australia up past the Gold Coast, they take human fetuses of babies and use them in a communion service? Some people are not aware of these things. They think it's some sort of a joke. It's not a joke. Satan is a real being, he's an enemy of God, and we are here tonight to blow his cover and to show you that Jesus Christ is greater than all the power of the enemy. Verse John chapter 4 verse 4, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So anybody tonight is into Satanism, you better get out of it as fast as you can. And that applies to witches as well, some of you here tonight. Now, over here you see Antichrist himself is setting himself up and when the stage is just right, he will reveal himself as to who he is. He will be the world leader and will run the common market and set up a peace treaty in the Middle East. Now, <clears throat> did you know that over every country in the world there is a spirit? There is a spirit over New Zealand and the name of the spirit over New Zealand is indifference. There is a spirit running Australia, his twin brother, indifference. New Zealand's motto, she will be right. Australia's motto, she'll be right, mate. <laughs> but of course it's not alright. It's bad actually. Some of you will know that this seal is on the back of the American dollar bill. It is the seal of the Illuminati or the world government people, the seal of Lucifer himself, and that eye inside the triangle up there is actually the eye of Lucifer. I remember when we were in Nazareth, in 1986 we went to the place where Jesus was brought up as a boy. Going down the steps of this great Roman Catholic church, we saw that eye inside a triangle on the wall of a church. Right above the spot where you go down to have a look at Jesus' uh, boyhood home, where Joseph and Mary brought him up in Nazareth. And my friend who was with me said, look at that. And I said, I'll ask the guide what it is. I said to this Arab guide, what's that on the wall? He said, that is the eye of God, sir. I said, is it? I said, you're an Arab, aren't you? He said, yes. I said, why don't you tell us the truth? That's not the eye of God. That's the eye of Horus in Egyptian mythology. And you know perfectly well it's the eye of Lucifer. Do you know what he said? He said, quite right, sir. Well, I said, why do you tell the tourists lies like that? He said, because we don't want to upset the tourists. How's that? In a religious building right above the spot where Jesus was brought up as a boy, there is the eye of Lucifer. Now listen, if you see that eye, or even the five-pointed star, or the six-pointed star, the hexagram, the pentagram, whatever, if you see them in a triangle, or in a circle, that is witchcraft. If you see them outside of that, it's nothing too much to worry about. Mainly inside the circle, and mainly inside the triangle, that will tell you definitely that that is witchcraft. Many other times as well, of course, even outside of the circle. Now, we're going to move on with our message tonight, uh, Mystery of Iniquity. And I'd like to get into it. <clears throat> Here we go. First of all, 
we see that the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ is given to us in the book of Acts chapter 10. Let's turn, shall we, to Acts chapter 10, verse 38. Many people do not speak about these sort of subjects because maybe it's a little bit old-fashioned. Some people say, I don't think there is a devil, and so on. Obviously, they haven't been traveling with us. We're reading in Acts chapter 10 and verse 38. I say that there is one man in New Zealand that God is using very powerfully in this field, and that is the man who very, very kindly allowed us to use his equipment, and I refer to Brother Bill Sabitsky. God is using him greatly in this particular field. Not many people get involved because it is a very tiring ministry. It wears you out. But thank God for everybody who does something in the name of the Lord. We have some of his counselors here tonight, and I thank you for coming. The Lord bless you richly in Jesus' name. Tonight we're going to read from Acts chapter 10 and verse 38. I'd like you to read with me, please. Here we go. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. So you can be possessed with the devil and you can also be oppressed with the devil. But wherever the terminology, wherever the devil is, he must go in the name of Jesus. And when I say go, he must go very quickly also. We don't spend hours and hours. There is no need to. He is so powerful. Tonight we're going to turn to our Old Testament reference, Deuteronomy chapter 18, if you'd like to turn with me, and we'll be using this as our resource material tonight. Deuteronomy 18. We're going to read together in verse 10. If you have a King James Bible, I'd like you to read with me, please. We're dealing with the occult that is so powerful in New Zealand today. All together, here we go. There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that useth divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch leaven, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord and because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. And so I see that God is against all form of occult. If you are involved in occult in any form, the strongest word I've ever seen written in the Bible is abomination. And God says it's an abomination in his sight. And the answer is get out of it as quick as you can. And if you don't know how to get out of it, at the end of this meeting, we have a team of counsellors. We will pray for you. We'll go quietly into the back room here, set you free in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will go home free in Jesus' name. There is no other name in the world that can set people free from occult bondage. You can use any politician's name, any philosopher's name, but only the name of Jesus Christ will set them free. Not the name of Buddha, not the name of Muhammad, only the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Devils know which name to flee at, and they will flee at his name tonight. Now, if you're into the occult in any form, including astrology, you will need to be set free. Did you know no witch can work without astrology? Uh, it is called in the word of God uh, an observer of times. It was for that reason that the Tower of Babel was destroyed. They tried to build a great tower that would get above the clouds, and they could tell their future from the stars. And so if you're involved in all that towers and... Uh, what are the other words? Cancer and all that sort of stuff. Forget about it. Get rid of it. Tear up all your symbols. Get rid of all your rings and stones and all this stuff to do with astrology and be set free in the name of Jesus. Very important indeed. I remember we had a friend. We still have this friend. His wife was very, very ill with cancer and a group of Christian men came to pray over this woman. And he told me the story later on. He said to me, did you know, Barry, that as they prayed, they saw a crab scuttling away sideways in the name of Jesus this crab was running and of course the crab is the symbol of cancer in astrology and therefore there is a link up between the name cancer and the disease as well and astrology and therefore my advice is to keep right out of it in the name of the Lord he knows what is good for us and what is bad for us now also would you get rid of anything to do with magazines clothing uh, uh, astrolo astrological jewellery be caref careful of health shops in the health shop they have all sorts of stuff mixed up together there you've got to discern what is good and what is evil birth signs birthdays health food trips and people who put you off meat now there's nothing wrong with be being a vegetarian provided you are not on a religious trip then be careful of that one let's read together shall we First Timothy chapter 4 verses 1 to 5 here we go you say, are you a vegetarian, Barry? Not really. 
There are times we just leave it alone for a while. It's good for your body to give it a rest and go on vegetables, no doubt about that. But God made us to eat vegetables and he made our teeth also to eat meat. We are carnivorous and we are herbivorous. And if we're meant to be only herbivorous, God made a mistake with our teeth structure. We're going to read together in 1 Timothy chapter 4, all together please, verse 1. Here we go. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. You say, what is the first doctrine of devils? Here it is, verse 3. Forbidding to marry. Do you know any group or church that tells people they cannot get married? That is a doctrine of devils. The Bible says it is not good for man to live alone and anybody who's seen a man that lives alone will agree with that. <laughs> he normally has sauce on his tie, he wears odd socks to the meeting and his bed smells if it needs a change. <laughs> the next one, the next doctrine of devils, it says here, and abstaining, uh, commanding to abstain from meats, that word is just foods, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Now this is interesting, verse 4, for every creature of God is good. You go to Southeast Asia, you go down the market there, one man offered me a rat in a cage. Man, I was walking down there, he said, buy my nice rat. And I said, not today, thank you. Maybe for some, but I'm not really into rats. Rat stew. I'm allowed to eat that if I want to. I can eat, I can eat ground up cockroaches if I want to. A chap I knew went to Tibet to be a missionary. And the word of God says you're supposed to eat whatever food is put in front of you. They gave him a bowl, this is true, a bowl with a, a yak milk butter in it with yak's eyeballs floating in it. And that was his first meal. You say, yum. Some people never heard anything like it, it's a fact. Some of our Maori brethren here will tell you they eat a very exotic dish called gangapiro which is rotten corn. I've been to many, many Maori camps in Hui's where they eat this food. I've never seen it before, nor smelled it. <laughs> they leave the corn in a river to, to go off for a number of weeks or months even. And then they bring it out and they just put it into a plate and make a porridge out of it, eat it with cream and sugar. Quite an amazing odour. <laughs> I was sitting next to an old Maori evangelist. His name was Worry Ward. Some of you older Christians might remember Worry. While he was sitting there, I was sitting here, I said, how do you eat this, brother? They put a bowl in front of me. He said, you get your spoon like this, and you go like this, and you go... <laughs> Let's read a little further, shall we? And then it says here, nothing is to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. I see then that God allows us to eat any food that is set in front of us. However, I would also recommend the reading of a book called None of These Diseases, by, written by a medical doctor from a Christian perspective who points out that very few Jewish people die of cancer because they are very careful about not eating unclean foods. That does not mean that we are bound up by the health law, but a Jewish person is built the same as I am, so therefore obviously if God tells them it's not good for them, it can't be good for me either. Just take it quietly on certain of those foods that are forbidden to the Jewish race also. It would be wise to do so. The next one, if you're into witchcraft, I recommend you come out as quickly as you can. Let's read together Exodus 22 and verse 18. This is the word of God. You say, are, you say, are there any witches around? Yes, some here tonight in the meeting. Exodus 22, verse 18. Probably trying to put a curse on me right now. Wasting your time. Let's read together, shall we? Verse 18, in the name of Jesus, I forbid you. All together, please. Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. Let's read it again. Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. Did you know that the penalty for witchcraft in the Old Testament was execution immediately? When we were living on the Great Barrier Island up here with the Arama Fellowship years ago, I was the school teacher. And I remember going across to the camp one night at, the, at um, Karaka Bay, and there was a young lady there who had arrived. She told me she was into witchcraft. And I said, what are you doing that for? She said, it's so exciting. I can put spells on people. I said, well, you'll be sorry. 
Sure enough, a few nights later, we were having a cup of coffee. The young lady came running in to see us. Help me, help me, she said. I said, what's wrong? She said, I went to bed tonight and there are faces all over my bed looking at me and laughing at me. Well, I said, the faces go with the witchcraft. If you want the witchcraft, you take the faces too. And then she was sleeping another, we prayed for her. She went back to her dormitory. There were a number of other girls sleeping there. And in the middle of the night, the piano started to play, but nobody was playing it. And everybody came out of the room at that point and started yelling and screaming. <laughs> and I want to point out to you that there, there are evil spirits around. These things are there. Some people don't know about them, but they certainly are there. We have many, many stories from different countries, different places we've been to. For example, years ago, when I first went to the island of Samoa, where I met my wife, I was up there and I uh, was staying in an old house on the waterfront. Some of you may know the house, you Samoan people will know it. It was owned by Pila Partu at the moment, but it was the house owned by Burns Philp. I used to run Bible classes in this house. It was a two-story place with lattice work on the front to let the air through and so on. The men I lived with, one was a drunkard and one was into a bit of astrology and palmistry and all this sort of stuff. And every night when I'd have my Bible class, I'd get crowds and crowds of young people. We'd come upstairs and we'd sing and we'd sing to the Lord and we'd preach the gospel and get people saved. And then I'd put them in my little Morris Oxford station wagon and take them home about 19 at a time. <laughs> and they wonder why the springs broke. It's a fact I had them in it and on it. I came in one night and I remember my friend, the, the man who was into palmistry, said to me one day, he said, Barry, I am sick of you and your religious meetings. He said, every time you have the meetings, he said, you stir up the spirits in the house. I said, of course I do. And I said, I will continue to hold my meetings. I came in this night about midnight and I heard a terrible banging noise. And so I went up to my bedroom and I thought there's probably a fight going on down below with these drunkards and so on having a party. I'll just go to bed and let them finish in their own time. I got up to my bedroom, the banging noise got louder and louder, and I thought, goodness me, I wonder what's going on here. I went across and I looked at George's room, the other man who was with me, and I knocked on his door, and I said, George, you're there, and he came out very sleepy with his pyjamas, and I, he said, no, I'm in my room. He said, what's the noise down below there? And I said, I don't know, I thought it was you. No, he said, it's not me. It must be the other guy. So we went to have a look at the other guy, he was paralytic drunk, lying on his bed. We tried to wake him up to ask him what was going on, but we couldn't wake him. We shook him, banged his head on the wall, nothing would bring him around. And so, I said, there's something strange going on here. I went back to my bedroom and I heard the sound of a man's voice outside. I looked, there was a man with a torch with his wife and family standing outside waving a torch. He was one of the local men and he called out these words, Mr. Perry, and up in the island there, they're not very good with the letter B, they call me Mr. Perry. So he called, Mr. Perry, he said, what is that noise in your house? I said, I've got no idea. And then I thought, maybe it's some sort of a devil, you know. It sounds like it. The furniture was being picked up and chucked around. It was dreadful. And so I said, what's wrong? He said, I can't sleep. This man lived away over on the swamp and he couldn't sleep for the noise in my house. They all came across to investigate. I'd never done this before. I shouted out the window, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ whom I serve, stop your noise, Satan, and go back to hell where you belong. And the man with the torch said, pardon, Mr. Perry? <laughs> And I said, not you. <laughs> and the next minute, there's an almighty crash. And at this stage, George and I ran down the stairs. We could feel the hair on your head like this. It was the most strange feeling. Prickling on the back of your neck, you know. And we went downstairs, and a giant dog ripped his way clean through the wall of the house, passed the man with the torch, ran across the bridge, and away down the coast, Friends of ours were living around the coast and they told us the next day a very strange noise went past their house at exactly that time after midnight it went Ooh. They thought it was a tidal wave coming. They didn't know what had happened at our house. And I tell you, we chased the devil in the name of Jesus. And it went in the name of the Lord. That was a very strange house. You used to have, the fellow who lived there before me said there was a woman used to walk up the stairs with, with her head under her arm. She used to comb her hair. And we used to hate coming in late at night, you know. When I was a single man, I'd go up the stairs. We always left a torch at the bottom of the stairs. And if, if there wasn't a torch, you used to yell out to the other fellow. He would shine the torch while you came up. It was a strange place. You'd be having a tea at night time and people would run in off the street and say, your kitchen's on fire. They'd see flames pouring out of your kitchen. You get out there, there's nothing. 
You hear cupboard doors shutting at night time. I was in bed one night and I heard footsteps come up the stairs and walk right along outside my room and I had this funny prickling feeling in the back of my neck. And, and I said, is that you, is that you, Ron? That was the other fellow who lived with me. Is that you, Ron? There's no answer. And I hear the footsteps turn around and go back the other way and down the stairs again. Very strange place. But thank God these things move in the name of Jesus. And if you don't believe that story, I've got the whole thing written on the wall of my home. I've got the photographs from the newspaper. I've got the article from the newspaper and it's all written up in my book. Uh, and all, many of these stories you'll find in the book Second Warning, which they'll, which they'll have on sale out there tonight. Wesley and Debbie Little will be looking after the bookstore. All the stories will be in here probably, uh, most of them anyway. And so I have learnt, friends, from the very early days of my ministry, get ready to chase these things in the name of Jesus. Don't let them stay there. Move them in the name of the Lord. Some of your homes need a good clean-up. And if you go and stay in a motel room or anything, you don't know what's been going on in there. You need to clean your motel rooms out in the name of Jesus and don't be afraid to do so. Now, witchcraft shows itself in, the various, in various ways. Number one is domination. Number two is manipulation. Number three, jealousy. Number four, rebellion. And number four, stubbornness. Grandparents must be very careful of domination. I have learnt this because I'm a grandparent myself. We have seven grandchildren and I find it is very easy to interfere with what our children are doing with their children. Grandparents keep out of it, otherwise you might get involved in witchcraft. Let your children do what they're going to do and leave them alone. Stubbornness is another one. You'll see a lot of young people today who have got a special look on their face. It's called being, here it is, cool. Actually the word cool is just another word for rebellion. There's nothing worse than a cool person around. I don't really like them very much. As we travel through New Zealand by car or different countries, my family, when they were young, used to look out the window and say, there's a cool one, Dad. <laughs> you see all these cool guys. I'll show you what a cool person is. He wears dark glasses when he doesn't have to. He walks a bit like Gary Cooper. <laughs> all he needs are six guns, you know. He's the sort of guy, you tell him a joke and he says, when's the punchline? Or he says, heard it before. There's nothing worse than a person who won't laugh at your jokes, you'll agree? <laughs> I have trained my family, whether they've heard it a hundred times before, always laugh uproariously. <laughs> we were, I remember one day we were, we were down at uh, American Samoa in the airport at Tafuna. And my son and I went into the men's washroom and a young Samoan chap came in from the islands. He was dressed in an American suit. He'd come right from the mainland. He was taking his suit off and putting on his national dress, his lava lava. And he spoke to us with an accent which was more American than the Americans. And he said to Andrew and me, he said, Say, where are you guys from? <laughs> and, I, and I said, New Zealand. And he said, New Zealand, eh? Cool, man, cool. And I said, yes, it is, is at this time of the year. <laughs> if you know anybody into palm reading or teacup reading, you want to get out of that as quickly as possible because that is a very, very dangerous thing. It leads into other occult uh, things. Leave it alone. Divination is specifically spoken of in the book of Deuteronomy 18, if you go back to that again. And there it says, God is right against anybody into this thing of divination. You say, what is that? It is the swinging of a pendulum over your pregnant friend's stomach to find out whether she's having a boy or a girl, even a cotton on the, uh, with a button on the end of it. And some people say, isn't that interesting? It goes round in circles or backwards and forwards. Did you know it is a spirit that makes that thing work? Divination also includes colour therapy or the swinging of any form of a pendulum. And when I was a young man, many of the Christians I was involved with used to go to colour therapists. I didn't really understand in those days. But afterwards I had to renounce it in the name of Jesus because it is not something which is good for Christians to get involved with. The word of God says leave it alone. Also anybody into water divining, it's sometimes called water witching, don't do it. Someone says, but that's how I find water. How am I going to find water if I don't do that? I'll tell you. How about asking God? A friend of mine did that on a farm up north at Rulawai. He said the man came on the property with the well drilling machinery. He said, I'll just get a piece of wire and I'll find out where the water is. My friend's a born again believer. He said, no, you won't. He said, I'll find the water, thank you. We don't have that on our farm. He walked around, he said, show me, Lord, where it is. There was a slight slope on the flat property. He stood right on top of the hill and the Spirit of God spoke to him and said, it's here. 
My friend said to the well drilling man, come and drill here please. The well drilling man said there'll be no water there, that's a slope. And my, my friend said, I'm paying for it, you drill. <laughs> so he drilled the hole and you know the water gushed out of that hole, the only slope on the farm, and he gets free water all the year because that is the only hill on the property. God knows best. Whatever the devil can do, God can do better. Spirit mediums. If you go and visit a spirit medium, you are in trouble. Let's read together, shall we, in Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 31. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, the third book, chapter 19 and verse 31. I don't speak on the subject very much. People always want to hear me talk about the money system and so on, but I think it is good for us to speak on this tonight. We're doing a full series here. We're reading chapter 19, Leviticus, read with me please. And we're reading in Leviticus, what did I say? 19, it can't be 31. Yes it can. 1931, let's read it together shall we? Everybody got it? I haven't. There it goes all together. Be, Regard not them that have familiar spirits, neither seek after wizards to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. Did you know that when a man dies, often a woman will go to see a spirit medium and the spirit medium will say, yes, I can call him up. She calls him up and this boy, voice speaks through the medium. A woman can speak with a man's voice. I've heard this sort of thing. It's quite strange, really. Horrible. And uh, the woman will say, yes, that's my husband. How are you, Bill? Fine, thank you. What's it like where you are, Bill? He says, the sky is blue, the birds are singing, everything's beautiful. Where are you, Bill? In paradise? He says, no, I'm a bull in the Waikato. <laughs> Reincarnation, that's another con. Did you hear me, listen? Reincarnation is a con. Any of you into reincarnation belief tonight? Did you know the people in the East hate reincarnation? It's a vicious wheel, you can't get off it. You go on forever. Thank God that the Bible teaches not reincarnation, but it teaches a resurrection from the dead. Don't you get on the reincarnation trip. The Eastern people would like to get off it. You stay off it. Don't be silly, please. The Word of God says it is appointed unto man once to die, but after death the judgment. And therefore we're going to be very careful of this one. And the woman thinks to herself, that sounds like Bill. It's not Bill. It's called a familiar spirit. And that spirit has been going around with Bill for many, many years and knows all about him. It talks like him. It knows all his favorite haunts. It knows all the secrets of his heart because that evil spirit has been with him. And when he dies, the evil spirit lives on. You can't kill an evil spirit. Any of you who have been to see a medium, you have been listening to demons, you are in direct touch with demons from hell and you will need to be set free at the end of this meeting in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. All spiritualist churches are demonic, all of them. A friend of mine years ago walked into one in Wellington and they were having a, a meeting, all the curtains were drawn, it was all very, very dark and they had their fingers together on the table and my friend walked in and spoke a verse from the Word of God. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. And as he said that, the whole meeting erupted. They said the people were running in all directions, trying to get out of the building into the light. They ripped the curtains down, they were tripping over each other, and people were vomiting all over the place. I've had meetings, you know, like this, and people have run out and vomited in the street as I've spoken on these subjects. Because spirits hate to hear the weaponry that we have. Here is our weaponry, and these are, the we these are the weapons we can leave at home. Listen to these ones. Leave at home, if you're chasing devils, your crucifix. He is not impressed with that. Number two, he is not impressed with holy water. Leave that at home also. These are the weapons you will use. The name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Number two, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Number three, the word of the living God. And number four, the anointed praise of God's people. Never get down to it and say, Oh Lord, what are we going to do next? That's not the answer. You come against the thing you expect to win and you will in Jesus' name. I remember we were in inland New South Wales one night. There was a girl there. She said, can you help me at the end of a meeting like this? I said, yes. What's your problem? And suddenly the thing in her took her over. She said, never mind. And she ran out the door, went down the street and was found lying in the gutter down the main street of this town in New South Wales. Two boys came in later. They said, there's a girl screaming in the gutter. I said, you better go and get her. So they went and they carried this girl in and they brought her in here and as she looked at me, she rolled on her face so that she couldn't look at me, you see. 
And I said, what is this thing? And her parents said, it's a generation thing. It's been in our grandparents. We've been set free from it. Now it's in the ghoul. It come down three or four generations. What does it say? The sins of the fathers shall visit the children to the third and the fourth generation of them that hate me. That's what the word of God says. Whatever you do, can, bad, evil thing that you do can affect generations after you. Remember that place. And so we see that this girl tried to bury her face in the carpet and I got down close to her and I said, you're coming out in the name of the Lord. And the thing said, I'm not. That actually sort of defy you now and again. They seem quite cheeky really. And I said, all right, you stay there. I'm going to read the Bible to you. And I took out my word of God and I placed the Bible right alongside the girl's body and I was going to use this weapon. I believe this was the correct thing to do at the time. I started to read from the book of Colossians where it said Jesus made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. And you know, that girl never looked up. Her face was buried in the carpet. Her hand went straight across to the Bible that she had never seen and went rip and tore the pages clean out of the Bible. Now how did she know where to look? The answer was that she wasn't looking at all but the devils knew where it was. And I said, you devil, you've ripped the Bible. <laughs> I said, I'll find another scripture. I went to Hebrews, I think. The word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. I put it down on the other side there, and I said, I'll read to you some more. And I was just getting ready. The thing says, no, and it went rip and pulled the pages out again. I said, you've done it again. <laughs> now, the good news was, it wasn't my Bible. <laughs> It was one I borrowed for the occasion. I said, we'll have to use another method now. I said, now you say after me, Jesus Christ, she said, I'll try, she said. I said, say it girl, you've got to get set free. Jesus Christ, she said, Jesus Christ, I said, is my Lord and Saviour. She said, is my Lord, and it gets her in the throat. And many of you who set people free will know it catches them by the throat and it almost throttles them to death. And they go all different colours, they're almost choking. And I said, you're trying to choke the girl, I forbid you, take your hands off her in the name of Jesus, set her free, and you speak the words. Is my Lord and Saviour. She said, I said, you can do it. Is my, is my, and I said, say it, is my Lord and Saviour. And the moment she said that, she rolled on her back, her eyes were clear like crystal pools, and she sat up and said, I am free. Very quick, very beautiful, and Jesus set her free. And that's the way it is, my friends. You say, does it work? It works all right. But you must recognize greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. If you go to fortune tellers, you're asking for trouble. <laughs> you might be a young lady sitting in front of a fortune teller with a crystal bowl. They put the ball, they put the ball there and she says, I see you. A handsome young man comes into your life driving a Rolls Royce. And you go, whoa. <laughs> I see you standing beside this young man at the altar in marriage. Oh, she says, marvelous. I see you with four beautiful children. Oh, how lovely, she says. And here comes the sting in the tail. I see you standing alongside the grave of a, of a little one who has gone. Ooh. Now what happens is these people build you up. That's satanic, you see. They build you up. It's a bit like Fabian socialism. Build you up. And then the next minute, you're in trouble. They give you the sting in the tail. That's what witchcraft does and that's what fortune tellers will do to you. Job chapter 3 and verse 25. Let's read it together, shall we? Job said these words and he's the man who went through a lot of problems. Just before Psalms to find Job, shut your Bible, open it halfway. It'll be Psalms, that's halfway. Go back to the left and you're in Job. Chapter 3 and verse 25. We're going to read the verse together. All together. Job 3.25 says Job, for the thing which I greatly feared is come upon me and that which I was afraid of is come unto me. Did you know that the devil zooms in on fear? That's why the Bible says we should not fear. If we're Christians, we don't have to fear. Who agrees with that? All together, for God hath not given us. Here we go. For God hath not given to us the spirit of fear but of power and of love and of a sound mind. That's what he's given you. Power, love and a sound mind. If you belong to Christ, if you have prayed the sinner's prayer and you are walking with Jesus, you have no fear of these things. We were in a meeting one night in Australia and at the end of the meeting there were over a thousand people there. There'd be more than there are here tonight. And when the meeting finished there was a loud screeching noise coming from the middle of the audience and I looked across and May came running to me and said, Quick Barry, come and do something. I said, what's happened? She said, there's a queen witch out there causing trouble. 
This woman was in the middle of the audience going like this, raking with the fingernails, and all the people were running in all directions. Their eyes were changing colour. They were going green, blue, purple, orange, all different strange colours. And I went close to her and she looked at me and my family were all watching this too. And I didn't feel any fear at all. I knew what we were doing. So I went across and I said, uh, in the name of the Lord Jesus. And you know, she looked at me and she said these words to me, you mole. My family loved that. My kids laughed, you know. Dad being called a mole. I thought that was funny. And the thing inside her said, you think you can get rid of me? I'm not a witch, I'm a queen witch, and I've been in here for 20 years. All the great men of God have tried to get rid of me, and you'll never do it. That's what she said. Direct challenge, and tried to rake my face with her fingernails. And I moved nice and close, and I put my face near her ear and said these words, I have news for you, and it's all bad. <laughs> here it is. You're coming out in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. When I give you the word, you'll be gone. Say, Dad! Spirit of the Queen Witch, I break your power in the name of Jesus. Come out in Jesus' name. Next minute, crash, flat on her back on the floor, and she is released in the name of Jesus. How is she now? Going well for Jesus. How long does it take for Queen Witches? About one second. <laughs> that's the power you've got. Witches here tonight, that's about the power you've got. About half a second's worth. In the presence of Jesus, you're doomed. Next one. Anybody who goes to university needs to watch this one. Colossians chapter 2. Let's turn to it, shall we? This is for the intellectuals among us. Did you know there is a spirit behind certain things that are taught at the university? One man described the university as the gateway to hell. Possibly true. Many young people go in there, they cannot handle the strain and it destroys them. If you're going to go to university, you need to be strong in the name of Jesus. I've been done some degrees in there, and I tell you what, she's a, she's a place of evil, but if you're a good Christian, get in there and win them for Jesus. Whatever they give you, give it back in the name of Jesus. We're reading here Colossians chapter 2 and verse 8. Let's read together about philosophy. A lot of people get involved in philosophy. Beware lest any, any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men and after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. It's possible to be a great Christian, go to university, get involved in the philosophy and finish up ruined. And that includes all the, all the arts dealing with the spiritual side of man. I believe if you want to be a medical man, you can deal with the body, good. But let's leave the spiritual side to God, shall we? There is the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, and the discernment of spirits that will deal with the spiritual side of man. If you get involved in, in philosophy or psychiatry or, you know, those sort of things, it's a very dangerous field unless you walk very close with God. You can sort out the problem, but can you cure the problem? And oftentimes you'll find that you promote the problem you're trying to cure because you sow the seed in people's minds. You say to this fellow, tell me what happened to you when you were a boy, and the boy loves it, you know, a bit of attention at last. He's lying back on the couch. I remember my cruel father beat me over the ear. Oh, is that right? And what happened to you? Knocked me right on the floor. Is that right? Yes, my grandmother growled at me the same day. And this stuff goes on and the boy begins to dig up all this stuff and he digs it up and he digs it up and it begins to get on his mind and all he can think about are these problems. Then he goes to someone else and he says, what do you think my problem is? The problem gets bigger and bigger because it is suggested to him and the things that are suggested to him become part of his makeup and he can't get set free in the name of Jesus. The secret is to take it all to Jesus and it says the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. God can not only take the problem away but wash away the problem and wash away the guilt with his precious blood. And we had an old a Chinese preacher through the country years ago, Leyland Wong was his name. His definition of a philosopher was a man who studies more and more about less and less until he knows everything there is to know about nothing. <laughs> I have a daughter who's a bit of a philosopher, my eldest daughter Becky, she's a very smart girl, she really is, out of the four of them. She sort of thinks very deeply. We used to travel in a vehicle and every time we traveled we would philosophize on various subjects. And one day I said, Becky, I said, we'll stop, shall we? I said, I think we'll stop our philosophy class. Let's forget about philosophy. Let's get into the Bible and see what God says. And you'll find you'll grow stronger if you'll see what God says and not try and philosophize about what men think is going on. Now, 
Anybody who's involved in seances and Ouija boards, you need to be set free in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lifting of tables and so on. I was having a meeting in Henderson one night. You may remember this one minor down Henderson Road, I think at uh, George Collins' place. You remember that? Uh, that was a dear man of God. And a young man stood up in that meeting and he said, can I speak? I said, yes. He said, one night we were playing with a glass on the table, you know, fingers on the glass, asking it questions. And he said, I'd heard about the name of the Lord. I thought I'd try something out. So I said, what can you tell me about the blood of Jesus Christ? And the next minute the glass went boom. And it flew to a thousand pieces. He said, I got such a fright, so did all the others. We will never try that again. <laughs> Some of you kids think it's funny doing that at school. Don't do it. It is dangerous stuff and you will be in trouble if you continue to do so. Now, did you know that there are also ancestral spirits? You get involved in your ancestral stuff. Many of you European people in this meeting tonight, you say, oh, the Maoris, the Polynesians, they're right into ancestral stuff. Anybody here tonight who is proud of being from one of the Gaelic countries, like uh, Scotland, Ireland, or Wales, any country that is Gaelic is the home also of witchcraft. And you may know that Stonehenge has got something to do with it. We had some people set free away down the country one night. They had travelled all the way from Auckland, about 200 miles to my meeting, and 200 miles back because they had a problem. They didn't know what it was. I didn't know either. But I came against the spirit of the gypsy, and this girl was set free, and they all went home rejoicing in Jesus' name. Never seen her before. Didn't know what it was. Had no idea, but God knew. Now, you be very careful of these things. Do not get involved in ancestor worship. People from Southeast Asia in the meeting tonight, you need to forget about your ancestors. Start again in the name of Jesus. Anybody in this meeting, forget about your ancestors. I went to one home and they've got the ancestry on the wall. They've got what the great-grandfather was and what he did and then the grandfather, then father. And this boy said, I'm going to be exactly like my ancestors and the whole family was bound up. How do you know what they were like? They could have been the biggest bunch of crooks around. Forget about your ancestors and start a new generation in Jesus' name. At least you know what's taking place from where you are anyway. But you don't know what your ancestors were like. Years ago, <clears throat> we were up and we've been to various places and had ancestral things happening. One story I'd like to share with you is one, a Maori story here. Uh, I was with Brother Murray Thompson once. We were up north at the tree at Waitangi. Some of you know the small tree just outside the par. And Murray Thompson and a group of Christians and myself gathered around that tree and we were going to lift the curse from off the tree. Many years ago, you remember the Queen was in New Zealand and a group of people were on their way back from the visit to Waitangi. They were coming down the hill of Bryn Derwins, up by Whangarei there, and the bus got out of control. The thing went over a, over a bank and killed many of them and they blamed it on a curse from that tree that was put on them by the people in the north, you see. They were a visiting tribe. And so Murray said, in the name of the Lord, let's go and shift this curse. We went, we marched around the tree and all the local people were looking at us. And as we marched around the tree a bit more, we started singing songs of praise to Jesus. And then Murray said, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I break the curse on this tree and lift it in Jesus' name. And immediately a great wind hit us and almost blew us off our feet. We were all hanging on to one another and it almost blew us away. That's a fact. And then the wind stopped and he said, I come against you in Jesus' name, you foul curse. I break you in Jesus' name. And the wind hit us again and almost blew us all away. And then he said, I'm sending you away in the name of Jesus. He spoke the name of the Lord again and he spoke the word and the wind hit us for a third time, almost blew us away. I've never felt a wind like it. It was a supernatural wind. The power was terrific. And when it was all finished, he took a branch off that tree. He went rip and he gave it to all the young people standing around. Here's some leaves. He said, you're still alive, aren't you? They said, yes. He even gave me a leaf. I looked at it, put it in my Bible alongside the verse in Matthew 16, 18, where it says, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That's a good one, isn't it? The gates of hell shall not prevail against the church of Jesus Christ. Some people are scared of the gates of hell. When they walk down the road, they say, look out, the gates are going to attack us. Very few gates come off hinges and attack you. It is your job to attack the gates of hell. The gates will not attack you, you attack them, in Jesus' name. And that is a story that is a true story. Sister Ada, you got a minute? Where's Ada? Want to tell him a little bit? You feel up to it? Another night. Okay, I'll get, I'll get my sister here to tell you a story another night. Okay. We were over in the Cook Islands. Here's a Cook Island story for you. We were having meetings around the coast. I see some Cook Island friends here tonight. Papa Va, where are you? Dear man of God there who worked with us for years. Papa Va, just raise your hand, brother, and wave it around. It's a man of God there that loves Jesus. We were in the Cook Islands of Rarotonga one night having a meeting. 
And uh, when it came to the end of the meeting, I had my little amplifier over there. And I stood over here and I have a little radio mic. You see, I had the amplifier at um, number eight. And as I gave the invitation to receive Jesus, a tremendous rainstorm came on the roof and, and it sounded like hail on the tin roof of the shed. And I tried to shout above it, but nobody could hear me. And I saw people running outside to shut their car windows. And then they all ran in again. And then the rain stopped and the, and the hail. And so I said to my son, when it go, what happens again, turn the thing up to number 10, you see. I said, now come and receive Jesus. Don't take any notice. The enemy's out to stop you. And as soon as I said those words again, inviting the people to come to the front to receive Jesus, down came the rain like hail on the roof. The noise was tremendous. You couldn't hear a thing. And as I spoke into the mic, they couldn't hear anything. And people still ran out and, to shut the windows of their cars, those who'd forgotten the first time. And I thought, oh no, the old truck we came in, it's going to be a mess. I've left the windows open. All the seats will be soaked. That happened three times. And once the meeting was finished, the people finally came to receive Jesus. I said, don't let anything put you off. That's the devil. That is satanic. What has happened tonight during the invitation? Do you know when the meeting was finished, we all ran outside. I went to have a look at the truck seat. I felt it. It was dry. I sent Andrew up on the, on the roof. He felt in the gutter. There was no sign of any water. Everything was dead dry. Even the sand was dry. Not a sign of any water. And we thought, that's funny. And then the next day... One of the policemen went to work, He's, he was a senior sergeant, he met another senior sergeant who was outside during the meeting, and he said, I saw you in the Land Rover last night while Barry Smith was preaching, did you enjoy the message? Yes, he said, it was great. And he said, there was one bit, that, one bit that really mystified me, why did the people run in and out three times at the end of the meeting? <laughs> and my friend, the Christian senior sergeant, was in the meeting, his name is Bobby Mutterpaul, if there's some of you want to ask Bobby about this. Bobby Mutterpaul said to this chap, he said, well, he said they ran outside to shut the windows of their cars because of the rain. And the seizure sergeant who was outside said, there was no rain at all. Not a sign of rain. All I knew was Barry stopped preaching three times. People seemed to run in and out for nothing. And I'm telling you, my friends, these things are around. There's some Samoan people here tonight. Some years ago, Auntie Minor will know this was true too. We were all involved in this one. I don't know if you were there, Massa. We were having a meeting in the middle of town by night in the reclaim area and they have three devils up there or two in particular that the people are frightened of and they are called in Samoan Sa Ma'iafi that's one and the other one is called Telesa they are like devil spirits and you talk to any Samoan about those things they will know them they walk around at night they put on human bodies and they walk around and people are a bit nervous about them and I was preaching in the open air one night we had a thousand people I was on the back of a truck and I said, you might be frightened of Sama Iafi and you might be frightened of Telesa and you can call in your witch doctors and rub them with leaves and the devils will go but they'll come back again. But if you chase them in the name of Jesus according to Mark 16, they will go and never return. And we went home, we were having tea at mine and sister's place the next night. There came a ring on the telephone and a girl said, can you come down, my brother has got one of these devils in him. Right in the middle of the meal we went down to the place and I said to the family on the phone, by the way, hang on to him, don't let him go, because when we try and come, he will try and escape to get away from us. You see, the devil in him will take him away. We got down there to the house, right in the middle of our meal, and instead of the family looking after the boy to hold him down, they were all hiding outside. And he was sitting on the couch, covered with perfume, looking up at a clock on the wall. He had an appointment at the graveyard with the devils. And he used to go down there every night. The devils would take him to the river and try and drown him to kill him, you see. And there he was getting ready for his appointment at the graveyard, looking at the clock. And so we walked in there and spoke to this boy in the name of the Lord. Brother Max Rasmussen was with us. Some of you know Max. And we walked in and said, what is your name? In the name of the Lord Jesus, who are you? And out of this boy's mouth came a woman's voice and said, Sama Yaf. I said, you lying devil. You're not Sama Yafi. You're a lying spirit. And we've come here to set this boy free in the name of Jesus. And the next minute we said these words, In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ whom we serve, you lying spirit called Sama, you have to come out of him in Jesus' name. No! And the next minute the boy leaps away up in the air, he came down, his eyes are clear, he said, I'm free in Jesus' name. How long did that take? Two seconds. And then we said, now the devil has gone out of you, you're free. He stopped looking at the clock on the wall, he blinked as if he'd come back to himself. We said, you're free, and he said, that's great. You now need to fill the space with Jesus. The devil has gone. The Bible says if you don't fill the space, seven others will come back worse than the first one. You need to clean the space out. Let Jesus, and he said, I want to do that. He received Christ into his heart. His mother burst into tears and said, can you help me? I'm a very wicked woman. 
She said, normally we call the witch doctor in to get rid of this, but I've never seen anything so quick and marvellous in the name of Jesus. What can we do next? And I said to May, please lead her to Jesus. She got saved. And over here as I was going out, another girl in the family said, I've been to Youth for Christ. I have received Jesus. I want to receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Can you help me, please? We said, receive the Holy Ghost in Jesus' name. And she began to worship the Lord in a language she had never learnt before. We all went home again that night and finished our tea. Remember that night? How long did that take? About 10 minutes to a quarter of an hour. It was all over because the name of the Lord is a strong and mighty tower. The righteous run into it and are safe. You can go to your psychiatrist if you want, but I'd rather run to Jesus because he has the answer to every spiritual problem. Now, if you're hassled with those sort of things, come out of it in Jesus' name. I've got other stories from different countries, but no time. Over in Australia, I learned that there is a curse called the wandering curse. Have you ever been to a meeting where you have young people who wander in and out all the time? They can't be going to the toilet every time, surely. They have a medical problem if that is the case. They go in and out because they cannot sit still. You'll find them all over Auckland City. They go in groups and they walk around. You'll see them in every area of Auckland moving all the time. They, many of the street kids are like that. They've got the mark of Cain on them. It is the wandering curse. If you read the Bible in the Old Testament, Mark got that thing, uh, Cain got that mark on him. It says that he would not be able to rest. He would be a fugitive and a vagabond all the days of his life. If you pray for those street kids, Set them free from the curse of the mark of Cain. It's a wandering spirit. People join your church. They can't sit still and listen to the word of God. They're always going out. They need to be set free in the name of Jesus. Yoga. Any of you ladies into yoga? You're into Eastern religion. That includes acupuncture and all that sort of stuff. All that Eastern stuff. Someone said, what is this yoga? I remember a friend of mine, Bob Ferguson, used to work with open-air campaigners told me of a woman up Hillsborough way, I think it was. He warned her, get out of yoga. And she said, it's all right, I only do the exercises. They all say that. She said one night she was going towards the traffic lights and her feet shot up under her seat and she was in the, in the lotus position going towards the traffic lights. At that point she got interested. And she rang Bob up and said, can you help me? And Bob says, yes, you can be set free in the name of Jesus. Do not do yoga and don't get involved in those sort of things. All Eastern religion is demonic. If you're an Eastern religion in any form whatsoever, Hinduism is simply uh, the worship of many millions of demons. That's all that is. If you see people with a dot on their head, that is the third eye, you see. That's the space where the demon enters, you see. And that should go. I've been up to Southeast Asia when people with a dot on their head get set free. They wipe the dot off immediately in the name of Jesus because they no longer need that third eye. You say, what else are you preaching about? The Baha'i religion. I see our papers full of it. Here's something tonight. My wife drew attention to this. She said, don't advertise that. You're advertising for them. And I want to warn you tonight, you get involved in the Baha'i religion, you're into a false cult. What they do is they try to exalt all the different great religious leaders and try to make a one world religion but there is only one way to God in spite of the fact that every man in his own way is looking for God God has ordained that there is only one way that man will ever get to know him and that is through the Lord Jesus Christ. I was saying that in a meeting, we had a public meeting at, uh, in, the, in the, oh, the North Island, in the North Island now <laughs> we had a meeting in this island one time in some town and it was full of farmers this meeting and I said, there's only one way to God, and that is through Jesus Christ. And a man in the audience jumped to his feet. The place was packed with farmers. And this man shouted at me, you call that love, do you? And then he started stamping towards the door. And as he went through the door, I said, thank you for your contribution. Good night. And out he went. And someone said to me, a lady came up to me. She said, you know who that was? I said, I've got no idea. She said, that was the local Methodist minister. I said, come on, come on. I said, he's on my side, isn't he? She said he should be, but he's involved in all sorts of strange things. And his brother is a Buddhist. And he believes the new doctrine, this is the new doctrine coming out of many theological schools today. Listen, you can call God by many names. All roads lead to Rome, therefore all religions lead to God. That is false. There's only one leads to God, and it's a person, not a religion. His name is the Lord Jesus Christ. What did he say? I am the way, I am the truth. I am the life altogether. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. How many come to the Father but by Jesus? 
No man. How many? No man. Nobody will get to the Father but by Jesus. You say, I don't want Jesus. Well, you won't reach the Father. That's obvious. It also goes on to say, He that honours not the Son, honours not the Father that sent him. If you want Eastern religion, you have your Eastern religion, but you won't see heaven. If you want Jesus, humble yourself, come to the cross, and be born again by the power of God, and Jesus will open the door. For he said, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. Not might be, but shall be saved. Bless the Lord for that tonight. We went down to a thing called, uh, where were we? We went down to Nambasa one time. Who's heard of Nambasa? We were down there one time and um, we've also been to Sweetwaters Festival. And down at Nambasa, I remember one night, one afternoon, at the Nambasa Festival, people said to me in the big Christian tent, there were 350 Christians gathered, they said, would you preach please? They put the microphone in my hand and said, you preach. And I said, what? I'm not ready. Never mind, they said. I didn't know what to say. The place was absolutely packed. We had a rainstorm. The rain came down and flooded the river, washed the bridges away, and all the eastern religious people were stuck on our side of the river. <laughs> and they all flocked into the tent. We had people with no clothes on. Goodness me, they had hay bales to sit on. Very few of those sat down. <laughs> what a strange sight. All these people, in the middle of winter, I don't know what they were trying to prove. There was mud up to your eyes. You've never seen mud like it. Mud everywhere. We had gurus there with white robes and beads and long beards and great shaggy hair at the back. I've never seen such an unusual bunch. They gave me a microphone. I stood at the front and made this statement. I thought, I'll get their attention anyway. I said, help me, Lord. I don't know what to say. Here I go. All Eastern religion is demonic. <laughs> that was my opening statement, you see. Now, the next minute, they all started to swear and curse and all these people started marching towards me, you see. Now, my, my son Andrew was sitting on a front hay bale along with his cousin Derek here. That's Minus' son. That's uh, Michael Jones is the football. He's going to speak on Sunday night and give his testimony. That's Michael's brother, Derek. He was there too, you see. And they were sitting together. And after the meeting, they said to me, Dad, they said, we thought you'd overdone it at that time. We were getting ready to come and give you a hand. Because these guys, these gurus, were marching towards me and trying to take the microphone out of my hand. I tell you, as sure as I stand here tonight, their hands were reaching out, but they could not touch my microphone. It was just like a glass wall all around me, and I just had to thank the Lord, friends. I'm so glad it works. If it doesn't, you're doomed, you know that. I, ca I carried on preaching my message. These fellows looked disgruntled, went back to their positions, wherever they came from. And then I thought, that was interesting, I'll try another one. I said, all martial arts is demonic, all of it, including Kung Fu, Taekwondo, Karate, the lot. And the next minute, the swearing, the swearing was disgusting. They were shouting and swearing. Some of you young fellows into martial arts tonight, you're into demonism. You've got demons in you. You don't know that. That's why you'll feel your arms tightening up now about here somewhere. You'll feel that and you'll feel your breath and a knot in your stomach when I talk to you. I'm saying that the thing in you is a devil. That's what it is. It's in, your, it's in you now. And you want to have a go in a minute? Now, I want to tell you what happened. When I said that, the black belts all jumped to their feet and they started marching towards me. And I saw Andrew and Derek getting quite tense, looking around like this. <laughs> they thought, Dad's done it this time. And the next minute, these guys came up towards me. Now, I didn't know exactly what happened. I was only interested in my preaching. I continued to preach. And there was an American fellow sitting on the front hay bale, a man who I know very well, who conducts the Israel trips we're going on. He now lives on the Gold Coast. His name is James Bigby. And if you want to ask James about this story, if you go on the Israel trip, ask him. He'll tell you. And we're going in November. Anybody who's interested, just put your name on a list at the door. We're going this year. James said, I was sitting on the front hay bale. I could not believe what I saw. He said, I saw one of the top black belt men there lift his hand back to get you. He said, he went like this. Ah, and he got his hand right back to chop you down. And you were so busy preaching, you never noticed. And he said the next minute, he suddenly, something took hold of his arm like this, and he went, oh, and he gripped his hand like that, and he ran out of the tent, and all the Christians got up and praised the Lord. And I'm telling you, that is a true story, friends. You say, do you mean to say that a Christian has got more power than a karate or kung fu person? That's exactly what I'm saying in the name of Jesus. You say, that you were lucky that time, they'd get you the next time. No, they didn't. We went up to Penang Island in Malaysia. And I went to a school, they were teaching this Eastern karate stuff. 
And I said, you're into demonism. They said, we are not. And I said, who teaches you? It's supposed to be a Christian school and they were teaching the kids all this Eastern martial arts. I said, who teaches you? They said, a Chinese man up on the hill. They said, he's a black belt. I said, can he break b bricks with his hand? They said, yes, he can. I said, I am challenging him now. There's only one way to settle this. My name is Barry Smith. Who's going to go? This boy said, I will. Go and tell him, I want to see him as soon as possible. I will pay for the brick and all we ask him to do is break the brick with his hand and I'll bind the devil in him just as he's going to hit it and he'll smash his hand on the brick. So up he went and all the school were hanging around. They're all excited. They're all sort of moving around looking, you know. Here's a contest. This will be good. The next minute down comes the schoolboy puffing and blowing and he said, I, all the kids said, what did he say? What did he say? They, they knew that he loved showing off and breaking bricks and stuff like that. And he said, he won't come. And I said, of course he won't come. That's just what I'm telling you. If it was him, he would come because he'd want to show off. But the devil in him knows that I know what it is. And because I know what it is, he will never come because he will be disgraced in front of the whole school because the power of God is greater than the power of the enemy. If you're into that stuff, you better stop it in Jesus' name. Some of you folks from Fiji know that they have fire walkers up there. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, it says there, there shall be none of you cause your children to pass through the fire. Did you know that fire, working, fire walking is a demonic exercise? They brought the fire walkers down from Bangor Island to Upper Hut. They dug a pit in the ground, Lower Hut, I'm sorry, at the Lower Hut um, Park Raceway, or the Lower Hut Park there. They dug the pit in the ground, they put the hot stones in, they went into their religious rites all night, they got themselves ready, and the next night, as they got ready to walk on the hot stones, listen to me, a friend of mine was sitting in the audience and he bound up the devils in their feet. And what happened to them? They all burnt their feet. And what happened to them? They all went back again to Fiji. They couldn't do it because there was a Christian binding up the devils in those fire walkers. Some Christians in this country, they don't want the power of the Holy Spirit. They say, oh no, God doesn't work today. He turned the big switch off, you know. Have you ever heard that? He turned the big switch off. He doesn't do those things today. That age is finished. Is it? How come the devil's still doing his thing? It says, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard against him. If the devil does it, God will also do supernatural feats. Isaiah 59, 19b. If you're involved in false cults, you'll need to be set free in the name of Jesus. If you're into Mormonism, Mormonism is just simply uh, an, an offshoot of, um, it's an offshoot of uh, masonry, Freemasonry. Did you know that Joseph, Joseph Smith was a Freemason? He went right through to degrees in a very short time. If you join the Mormons, all they're going to do is put some Freemasons curses on you, that's about all. And you will know that the Freemason symbols are simply the, uh, the square and the dividers. You know the dividers look like that? Or the compass, they call it the square and the compass. You go down to Hamilton to Tukaramia, where the Mormons have got their temple, and look on the veil, go through the temple ceremony, and you will see the square and the dividers on the veil there. If you get to know any Mormons, you'll find that many times they will wear endowment garments, which are secret underclothes, next to their skin as a form of protection. It's got Masonic symbols on it. And therefore, if you're into Mormonism, you're into Freemasonry, and you don't even know it. It is a very evil thing. And the final secret of Freemasonry is Lucifer is God. Has anybody ever heard of the Freemasons, by the way? They are around, I believe. And you'll find that Freemasonry is one of the most demonic things in the world today and is actually involved very strongly in the world government system. Now let's have a look. Can I have that eye on again? Do that one there, please. Put this on. Have a look at this. Some of you have got relations and ancestors in Freemasonry. That eye is worn around the neck of the Grand Master of the Lodge. It's part of his jewellery. It's the eye of Lucifer, the eye of Horus, actually the eye of God's greatest enemy. And the Freemasons call him the great architect of the universe. And any of you who have got family members who belong to the Lodge, I better tell you what they've done so you will know. And we will have a setting free tonight, anybody who's into Freemasonry, and God will set you free. That includes husbands, wives, children, ancestors, and those who are involved in it. When you first join the Masons, they put a black hood over your head. You join the first degree. If you're in New South Wales, I believe now, they've changed things slightly. You take an oath to say that you go along with the symbolism, but you don't actually do all the things now. In New Zealand, however, you'll draw your thumb like that across your throat, and you'll, you'll threaten to cut your throat, or have your throat cut, and your tongue torn out by the roots and so on, when you join the first degree of the lodge. 
That is called uh, entered apprentice degree. You then test the word of God once sealing a witchcraft oath on the Bible. Imagine one of your family members, your father or your husband, with a black hood over his head. That's what they do. They roll the trouser leg up. They've got his shirt drawn up over the chest and they're pricking him with the point of a compass at this point. And they've also got a running noose around his neck. They say if he runs forwards, he'll be stabbed by the compass. And if he goes back, he'll be hung by the running noose. That is witchcraft. And every mason has done that. And don't come and tell me afterwards you haven't because you have. Next one. Fellowcraft. When you go into fellowcraft, the second degree, you put your hand like a claw, you draw it across your chest like that, and say, I will have my heart torn out if I divulge the secrets of the Masonic Lodge. You then kiss the Bible twice, sealing a witchcraft oath on the word of God, this is blasphemy. Number three, you join the third degree, this is called uh, uh, the Master Mason, all this is in my book by the way, uh, second warning and the sum and first warning, but second warning is the best, it's got um, all this Freemasonry up on how to set a Freemason free. There's a whole chapter on that. The third degree, he actually uh, draws his hand across his thumb, across his stomach like that, threatens to have his bowels pulled out and thrown along the seashore and all that sort of thing. Then he falls down, he has a death experience, he views the death symbols, the skull and bones and the coffin and so on. Um, and then he has a mystery resurrection. It's almost a parody on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He wears a lambskin apron, he's, he has a belt on, and the belt buckle is in the form of a snake or a serpent. And someone says, witchcraft is not involved in Freemasonry, it is a Christian religion or a Christian thing. No, it is not. It's got nothing to do with Christianity. And if it has, how is it that on the Grand Master's de uh, paper here, certificate, you've got a picture of Moses over here in the third degree, and Moses has got horns on his head. What's Moses doing with horns on his head if this is a godly religion? Moses does not have horns on his head. Next one. I will go a little bit further. A man goes beyond the Blue Lodge, he moves into the Red Lodge, he gets involved in the Royal Arch degree. He learns the secret name of God, which is Jar Bull On, represented by the letters J-B-O. Jar stands for Yahweh of the Hebrews. B, B stands for Baal of the Assyrians. And, this one, um, and the other one, On, stands for Osiris of the, of the Egyptians. You have a triple-headed monster here in the Red Lodge under the Royal Arch degree in Freemasonry. That is not the God we serve. The God we serve is the living God. The God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. What amazes me is there are certain religious men belong to the Lodge. Listen to this. Archbishops and bishops in the Anglican Church. Presbyterian elders and ministers. And the sooner that thing is broken, there will be revival in New Zealand. Did you hear what I'm saying? There are certain ministers around the country who are listening to me now and listening to others like me, Brother Bill Sabitsky and others are speaking the truth on this thing. The whole of this country needs a good clean-up in Jesus' name. It needs to come right out of the churches. Some Salvation Army officers are even in it. Some Baptist people are in it, I believe. You say, what about the Roman Catholics? Are they in it? Yes, they are. A man called David Yellop wrote a book called In God's Name. Get hold of David Yellop's book and have a read. And then there you'll find, I saw him on TV in Perth one day, the interviewer said, are the Roman Catholics allowed in the Lodge? And he said, yes, they certainly are. In the Vatican, there are over 100 of them belong to the Lodge. And you know about the big P2 scandal over in Italy and the Vatican Bank and the Mafia on the other side? Read the book in God's name. You can buy it in paperback. It's cheap enough. Just buy it and read it. And you can read all this in there. There is a, a, there is a link up between the Mafia, the Vatican Bank, and the P2 Masonic Lodge on the other side. Read the book and it will clarify your mind very clearly. And so we see there, the interviewer said to David Yellow, um, if it is true that there are people in the, in the lodge that belong to the Vatican, do you have any proof? He said, I'm glad you asked that. He undid a scroll of over 100 names of people in the Vatican that belong to the Masonic Lodge. And so we have people from every different denomination who belong to the system. If you're in it, listen to this. It goes on and on and on until they catch you right out at the top and you learn the final secret of Freemasonry spoken of by the top man in Freemasonry whose name was Albert Pike. I will now quote to you the final secret. This is a 33rd degree Mason spoken to the 23 Supreme Councils of the world on the 14th of July 1889. This will show you who the God of Freemasonry is. Now you'll see here, I'll put this on the video, there is the lodge floor. You notice that? Black and white squares. Anybody see that up the back there? Can you see that? The black and white squares there. Where else do you see those black and white squares? Anybody ever notice the policeman's hat? And if you read a book called The Brotherhood, 
you'll find that the police are riddled with them also. And if you look at Parliament, you go to Parliament in, in New Zealand, down the beehive there, the floor is the same as that. Black and white, it's simply dualism. Black, white, black, white, it's an Eastern concept. Good and evil, male and female, you see? Darkness and light, Chinese, yin and yang. What's the final secret of Freemasonry? There are two gods. They have the god that we worship, Adonai, and Lucifer is the other god. I will now give you the quote. Here it is. Albert Pike says, That which we must say to the crowd is, We worship a god, but it is the god which one adores without superstition. To you, Sovereign Grand Inspectors General, we say this, you may repeat it to the brethren of the 32nd, 31st, and 30th degrees. The Masonic religion should be, by all of us initiates, maintained in the purity of the Luciferian doctrine. If Lucifer were not God, would Adonai, as God of the Christians, bother to spread false and harmful statements about him? Yes, Lucifer is God. Do you know anybody in the lodge? Lucifer is in charge of every lodge. It was infiltrated in the year 1778 by a man called Baron von Nigg. He was a Luciferian also. He goes on to say, unfortunately, Adonai is also God. For the eternal law is there's no light without shade, no beauty without ugliness, no black without white, and so on. And then he goes on to say, um, Lucifer, the god of light and the god of good, is struggling for humanity against Adonai, the god of darkness and evil. What does that mean? It means they turn our god into the black god, the evil one, and they make their god the god of light, Lucifer. I want to say tonight that Lucifer is not the god of this world, not the god of light. God, Lucifer is the god of this world, but he is not the god of light. Eastern religion might be alright for every other belief, but it doesn't work out with Christianity. There is no dualism in Christianity, and that's why a Mason has taken on a long trip of 33 degrees. What for? To gradually get him round to this way of thinking. So he can have fellowship with people of Eastern religions, you see. They believe in dualism. The only problem is, when a Christian understands this, he knows the God we serve does not have an opposite. The God we serve is light. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. And the good news I have to say tonight is this, my friends. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, every Mason, his wife, children, and ancestors can be set free from those curses. You say, is there a curse on us? Yes. From the moment that man joined the lodge and did the cutting of the throat, that's where the curse comes on. He puts a curse on himself, a curse on his wife, a curse on his children, a curse on his generations, the three and four generations, and the curse can be broken after this meeting, out the back here, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I've got stacks of things to tell you about this, but no time. Let's move quickly on with the message, shall we? You say, what about the New Age movement? You've mentioned that tonight up there. I've got some stuff on the New Age I'd better share with you. The New Age is moving very, very quickly in the world today. <clears throat> and on page 79 of my book, 75, I'm sorry, it talks a little bit about the New Age to explain what it is. The New Age movement is creeping in to, all, uh, to many different religious groups and it is around the world, particularly in New Zealand today, because we are the world's first for world government, starting next year, 1990, you'll know that. They say that witchcraft and demonism merges into a oneness with good. One of their key phrases is oneness. Get in touch with yourself, they say. How ridiculous touch with yourself indeed. Have you ever heard of the feminist movement? The feminist movement are into this thing, the new age, they believe it's a political crusade to gain equality with men. Over in New South Wales we have a group of friends who live on a, who have a farm they own, they don't live on it, and right near their farm they've got a group of women who are lesbians and they're right into the women's movement, they call them the mountain women. When we go to visit this particular farm in New South Wales, the mountain women get, walk up the path alongside the farm and then they disappear up into the bush and no man is allowed on the property. There is a spirit inside those women. They are very unhappy, very, very unhappy indeed. And I could never understand why a woman would go like that. A woman made so beautifully by God would allow herself to get like that. And then the other day I read an interview by a woman called Germaine Greer. You may have heard of her. And my heart broke for that woman when I heard what she went through. As a girl, she said her father took no notice of her whatsoever. It was just as if she wasn't there. 
Whenever she did something at school, the, the father never recommended her or commended her or said how good it was. He never showed her any love or attention. And what, the, what was the result of that? Here's a warning for all fathers tonight. Do you realize you can drive your girls off into hating men if you don't show them natural human fatherly affection? And that's the result. One of the women who led the feminist movement, a very, very unhappy lady, she's getting older now, and of course, when you get older, people desert you and you are left alone to live your life because nobody really wants to know you later on. I spoke to a woman one night after a meeting like this. She said, Barry Smith, you know when you said that about the feminist, she said, I hated you. The thing was in me hated you and I wanted to shout at you that I knew what you were saying was right, but I didn't know how to get over the thing. And praise God, she got set free. Women's liberation actually is, what is it called? Satan's fib to Adam's rib. That's women's lib. At least the little phrase might stick. You say, what is their goal? Their goal is matriarchy, not equality. They want the women to run the men. Any witch will tell you what it is. It's called Wicca. Now you have black witchcraft, you've got white witchcraft, and Wicca is involved in the following things. Listen to it. It's the mystery... Number two, sexuality. Number three, the psychic abilities of the female. And number four, to overthrow the global rule of men. All you will find in that movement is sadness. And I say, do not be involved in that, please. Come out of all that. If you're in the New Age movement, recognize that they teach this. All is one. They teach that evil is good. God and Satan are one. Everything that you want can be found within yourself. Alternative lifestyles are okay, homosexuality, lesbianism, free love will free you from the moral restraints of life. Is that right? The Bible says there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the ends thereof are the ways of death. Don't you ever go those ways, my friend. I'm here tonight to bring, act as a warning. I am a voice in the wilderness crying out, if you're in the New Age movement, get out of it in Jesus' name. I was over in Perth recently, I got off the plane and I felt absolutely shocking. I've been a bit of a physical wreck lately, I'm alright now. And I got to visit my friend in Perth and he said, we've got you down to run meetings at night? I said, yes. And also to speak at the New Age Conference down at Fremantle. Okay, I said. The afternoon I was due to speak at the Fremantle show, I tell you what, I just about died, friends. Such was the power of that thing. They knew what was coming because I'd been to Fremantle before. And all the devils down there knew also. They had a go at me. And they took me back to the pastor's house and I almost died. The friend that was with me, he's a, he's a, he's a, a man who's involved in health and so on. He said, my word, if you were close to death, you were close to death that afternoon. He said, they sat me in a chair and he said, they prayed over me and they pumped me full of water. They just made me drink water and drink water to try and bring me back again. I was just a complete wreck. And it was about 10 to 2 and I was due to speak at 2 o'clock and I said, I'm all right now, here we go. And put my water bottle down and off we went, down to Fremantle. And I spoke at this Fremantle gathering. I've never seen such a lot of New Age people all there together. They were looking at each other's feet. They were examining each other's irises and looking at all the different parts of the body and they were all trying different things out. All these little workshops all over the place. And I got a chance to tell them about Jesus. And I want to tell you, my friends, when you come to the end of life, all that therapy, all that talk they've given you will come to nothing. But Jesus is the one you need. What's his name? Jesus, the biggest name on my chart. He's called the stone that the builders rejected, but God made him the head of the corner. You can go to a party, did you know that? You can talk to all your friends and be with it. You can say, what do you think of my mantra? What do you think of my guru? I can tell you all about my guru. Tell, him, tell you about I Ching and all this stuff. You talk about Eastern religion, everybody will flock around you, mention the name of Jesus, they make you wish you'd never come to the party. Funny thing that, isn't it? The only one who can save them is the only one they don't want. I've been all around New Zealand, Australia, different countries. I was in the back of New South Wales one time, down by Back of Orange somewhere. And these two boys came to my meeting, May remembers them. They sat over there, they were drunk as lords. Listen to the message. And they came out the front at the end to receive Christ. And I thought, goodness me, they don't know what they're doing. They're paralytic. They stood like this. One man stood like this. And he went, he was like this. Receiving Christ, saying the sinner's prayer. I said, face this way, would you? No, I'll look this way, he said. I thought, there's no hope for him, you know. When they got ready to go home, I said, excuse me, you two, if you come back to the meeting again, try not and drink before you come. Your brains will be in better order. The next night they came back dressed in beautiful suits. 
notebooks, Bibles, pen, the lot. They're all ready to go. When the meeting was finished, I spoke on this particular subject. One of those young men came up to me and he says, boys, if that was interesting tonight, he said, I've been into a bit of occult stuff myself. In fact, everything you mentioned tonight. <laughs> I said, have you? He said, yes. He said, I've just come back from Thailand. He said, I've been in prison over there. He said, I was chucked into, pri into prison on a drugs charge. He said, look at the monkey tooth around my neck. He said, I didn't mind prison though, he said, because there was a, they chucked in a Thai chick with me. That was good fun. I said, is that right? And after I'd finished setting the people free in the name of Jesus that night, we were busy setting them free. The floor was littered with people and everybody was sort of getting set free in the name of Jesus. And this young man was there with his notebook and pen sitting on the steps up here taking notes. And when it was all finished, he said, that was interesting. He said, I think you better have a go at me. So we did. We started to pray with him. And he got set free. And in the middle of his deliverance, he reached up and he grabbed this monkey tooth around his neck and he went, rip. And he said, that'll have to go. And I said, who told you that? He said, I don't know. It's just got to go, he said. And he was completely set free in the name of Jesus from all this drug stuff. I said, isn't that funny? Where have you been? He said, I've been right through Southeast Asia. I've sat at the feet of all the gurus. I've learned all the mantras. And I come back to Aussie and find out that Jesus was who he said he was. Go on, go and do your hippie trial if you want to, but you'll come home and find no satisfaction because Jesus is still the way, the truth and the life. The next night we prayed for the baptism in the Holy Ghost. And the young man came and he said, I need that too. And he and his friend both received the power of God. We jumped in the truck, we drove over the Blue Mountains that night back to Sydney and I looked in the mirror, it was raining, there was drizzle and I just looked through the drizzle, I saw all these guys hanging onto each other, weeping, tears, as God had changed their lives by the power of God. Remember walking down the coffee bar the night before with this boy, he'd just been saved and delivered, we're walking to the Christian coffee bar, and as we walked he turned to me and he says, Barry, I said, yes, he said, I suppose I'll have to get a job now. <laughs> <laughs> Who told him that? If any man be in Christ, say it with me, he is a new creature, old things are passed away, behold, all things are become new. That man was saved and set free in the name of Jesus. If you're involved in any way with false religious groups, you'll need to be set free. There's one group I speak specifically about, and that is tonight the Jehovah's Witness group. If you're involved in Jehovah's Witnesses, they say that Jesus was not God. And I'd like to say tonight that if you say that, you are damning yourself. Because if Jesus is not God, there is no salvation for any of us. No man can save another man. You say, how do I know Jesus was God? That's easy. Every time he said, I am, he was claiming equality with God. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. I am the light of the world. I am the living bread. I am the water of life. Who was Jesus? He was God manifest in the flesh. And when he said, I am, you remember the soldiers coming into the Garden of Gethsemane? I think I mentioned this the other night. Jesus called out to them, Whom seek ye? We were in Gethsemane, actually just a few months ago, on our Israel trip. We were in there and I remembered this, and I looked at those old, old battered trees, the old olive trees, and I thought of the soldiers coming in and Jesus calling out, Whom seek ye? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said, I am. Check your Bible out, the word he is in italics. It's not in the original, put in there by translators. What happened next? Soldiers all fell over backwards to the ground. Why did they fall to the ground? Because Jesus was claiming equality with God. I'll show you why. Did you know that when a baby is in the womb, that's a, that's a stomach there by the way. <laughs> some legs on it so you recognize it, there it is. <laughs> you can see I took art at school. Okay. We're right up on the subject. We've got seven grandchildren. I actually delivered my own son. I know a lot about this subject. Here is a baby in the mother's stomach. There's the womb, there's the baby in there. Did you know that the mother's blood never touches that baby? Did you know that? The mother's blood flows around the baby, but it is the father's blood that is actually within the baby. Now what does that mean? It means that when Jesus was in the womb of Mary, what do we find? It was the Father was the one that gave it the, the power to call itself God. That baby was God. It was Emmanuel, which means God with us. What does Emmanuel mean? God with us. 
not, not some picture of God or something like that. It means God veiled in the flesh. John 14 verse 6 says, Jesus said, I am the way. But it also says in John 14 that the Word, what? Became, what? Flesh. Now who was the Word? It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In other words, when I speak tonight, my Word is part of me. When I speak, it's me revealing myself. You can't see my words, but you can still hear them. But imagine if my words could put a human body on, and that those words could stand here, they would be a part of me. And that's exactly what Jesus is. He is actually God himself revealed in the flesh. Praise God for that, friends. When Jesus died on the cross, they hung him on the cross. I've been to Calvary, my wife and I have been there. I tell you, when you see Calvary, you'll be excited. The place where Jesus hung on the cross. All his bones were out of joint. He wasn't hanging on a stake, he was hanging on a cross. You can't put people's bones out of joint that way. The way they did it was to stretch the sinews so they went right out of joint. And as he hung on that cross there, my friends, his blood flowed down to the ground and it was that blood that saves us from our sin. Whose blood was it? The blood of God himself. Was it tainted with Mary's blood? No. Was Mary a sinner? Yes. She said, my spirit rejoices in God my saviour. Who needs a saviour? A sinner. Was Mary a sinner? Yes. And when you read my book, I will prove all this to you. I've been writing it this afternoon. I've gone right through church history. And I found the doctrine was made up very, very later on, about 1800 and something, where, uh, where they said Mary was immaculately conceived. No, she wasn't. That was made up in about the 1800s. She was a sinner. She needed a saviour. And I want to say, thank God Jesus is God. Praise God Jesus came to save us from our sin. If you're in the Jehovah's Witness Church, you better come out of it, friends. I'm telling you tonight. I'm being kind, but I want to say come out of it. Because if you deny that Jesus is God, there is no salvation at all for you. None at all. There can't be. No man can save another man. Never. And so, you say, what about these other religions? Is there any hope for them? God will deal with the other religions. You say, what about Armstrongism, the plain truth? Who's ever read the plain truth? There is a book out about that called The Plain Truth About the Plain Truth. And the plain truth about the plain truth is it is not the plain truth. It was written by a man called Mr. Armstrong who said he was the last uh, prophet on earth that God was going to use. And he said there can be no salvation. You've got to wait for the judgment. He was mixed up with the Seventh-day Adventist group. He believed in keeping a Sabbath, which was the old Jewish law. He also was very good at reverse advertising, saying you take my magazine free, it will cost you nothing. That's called reverse advertising, where people feel ashamed to take something for free, and so they sent money into him, he became a multi-millionaire through the gifts, through reverse advertising. Very clever indeed. And Mr. Armstrong says you can't know if you're saved. Praise God, the Bible says you can. I'm saved. Who else is saved tonight? Hands down, please. Don't embarrass your neighbours. Thank you. <laughs> if you're saved, you'll, you'll, you'll know it. If you're married, you'll know it too. I say to some people, are you saved? They say, I'm not quite sure. Imagine if I said, are you married? And you said, I'm not quite sure. That's ridiculous, you can't do that. Imagine if someone said to me, are you married, Barry Smith? And I said, oh, I just can't quite put my finger on it. I may be. I just, uh, ridiculous. You say, are you married? Answer, yes. How do you know you're married, Barry Smith? Answer, I was there when it happened. You say, what happened? I found myself in the front of a church. I was married up in the islands. A girl stood beside me on that day. My heart was going like mad. I was very, very confused. My legs were like rubber. You've had this experience, some of you? You hear a voice speaking and later on you find it was yours. <laughs> it's no use saying I didn't mean it. No use saying to the minister, excuse me, I didn't mean that. Too late, he says. That's how you get saved. Listen to what Jesus said. I want you to get this please. The word of God is written in Romans chapter 10 so that we can know we are saved. Romans chapter 10 verse 9 altogether. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth. What have you got to confess? Jesus is what? Lord. Jesus is Lord. And then believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be, not might be or could be, but shall be saved. Not many groups will tell you this, friends, but I'm telling you tonight, the Christians believe we can know we are saved. How many organs do you use to get saved? 
your heart and your mouth. You believe with your heart and you confess with your mouth and by the grace of God you get saved. Isn't that wonderful? Sometimes I get people up here and they stand here and I say, you receiving Christ as your saviour? Some bit shy, they go. Hmm. The minister says, will you take this woman to be your lawfully wedded husband? And she goes, hmm. <laughs> That's not right, is it? We'll try that once again. Will you take this woman to be your lawfully wedded wife? That's better. And he goes, hmm. That will not marry you. You'll say it properly. You say, I will, or I do, or yes. And when people come to the front, I like it when they speak clearly to me. And if you come to the front to get saved tonight, please speak clearly. Just say yes, like that. When I go through Australia, the men over there, the farmers get saved. Hundreds of them, great big men they are. And when they shake my hands, I tell you what it's like shaking hands with a plate of meat. Great big hands. I look up at these guys, they're much bigger than me. Are you receiving Christ? And they go, sure am, mate. <laughs> you hear me talking a lot about Australia, don't you? Tell you why, did you know that you'll be a state of Australia soon? I'm not joking, you'll be a state of Australia soon. They're buying up all our land, our farmland. They're coming over here by the hundreds. They know it's a state of Australia. There's a young lady, one of you here tonight, um, Frances, are you here, the, the hostess? Frances, the air hostess? She was in our meeting one night, we were here last time we preached here, and Francis works with Air New Zealand. We were flying to Aussie the next night to Brisbane. She was on our plane. And she took us up to see the pilot. He was a Christian also. And I remember Francis, I just said to her, Sister, um, what's it like? Do you enjoy doing international flights? And she said, this is not international now, this is domestic. <laughs> Romans chapter 10 verse 10 explains it a little more. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And what does that tell me? It tells me the following. I've got good news for you tonight. If you are saved, you will know you're saved. If you are not saved, God wants you to know you are saved, and there will be an opportunity in just a few minutes for you to give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Just something here for nurses. There must be some nurses in the meeting tonight. This was given to me by a brother the other day. Did you know that when you join up nursing, our daughter has gone nursing, and I'm going to ask her when I get home, this is the New Zealand Nurses Association uh, were written to and asked about the oath that the nurses take. And the answer is, from the uh, Nurses Association of New Zealand, the statement or declaration that nurses make on graduation is not a requirement set by the New Zealand Nurses Association or the Nursing Council of New Zealand. It depends on the nursing school, what is included in the program. But in the graduation, this is what the nurse would be asked to say. The five-pointed star, there it is, the five-pointed star, uh, is the recognised badge of those connected with medicine. It originated with the priests of the Temple of Isis some thousands of years before Christ. So it goes through the hand, the foot, the knee, the breast and the head. Under the knee it says here, the oath says, that my knee shall bow in supplication to the almighty creator Ra for guidance and aid in my endeavour to succour and relieve the sick and suffering. That's interesting. Certainly not the God I serve. You say, goodness me. Never thought of that before. I'm going to go quickly on here, please. Anybody involved in card reading, including tarot cards, ESP, numerology, handwriting analysis, all that stuff, you need to be set free in Jesus' name. Halloween is out for Christians. <coughs> Hypnotism is yielding up your spirit to a demonic force. De facto relationships is not on in the sight of God. If you continue in sin, the word of God says, you will have to go to hell because the wages of sin is death. If you're in de facto, you need to stop tonight. Say to your friend after the meeting, I'm sorry, but we'll have to go somewhere else tonight. You go somewhere, I'll go somewhere, and we'll get married properly according to the word of God. Hebrews 13, 4. Marriage is honourable and all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. You say to your friend, I'm sorry, we can't stay together as from tonight. We'll get married properly, and then we'll see you again. God bless you. <laughs> Abortion. Abortion is the spirit of murder, Psalm 139. Let's turn to that one for a moment, shall we? Unless you have had it done because of some physical defect and it's between you and God and your husband, I want to say otherwise, if you are a loose living sort of a person and go around having babies and then murdering them, God will require that baby at your hand later on. 
Psalm 139, verse 13, read with me. For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. Then it says, um, verse 16, Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect, and in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. What does that mean? It means as the baby is being formed in the womb, God writes them all down in a book. That's lovely, isn't it? He says two legs, two arms, one head, and so on. Two feet, ten fingers. It's all written there. The day of judgment, you stand before God, and God says, hello, where's the baby? You say, there the never was a baby, Lord. It says to an angel nearby, bring the book, please. Okay, here we have it. Two arms. Two. Oh, Lord, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't... The point is to clear it up with the Lord now. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Praise God for that. We have a group here tonight to pray with anybody who's got all these problems at the end of this meeting. We're going to have a, a, all the folks who need prayer. We want you to come tonight and let's clean this thing up in the name of Jesus tonight. God will bless you. Compulsive gambling. Some of you can't stop gambling. You're at the TAB all the time. You've got a devil in you. Wasting your money. Booze. You can't stop drinking. God will set you free. It says no drunkard will enter the kingdom of heaven. Did you know that? No drunkard. I don't know what percentage God takes as uh, being a, uh, calling you a drunkard. but no idea. I know what the law of New Zealand is, but God's law may be different. Drug taking. If you take drugs, you will never see heaven. Revelation 22 and verse 15 makes it clear. These are the people who will be outside of heaven. Some of you may have done these things, but by the grace of God, you can be set free. Revelation 22, 15, re referring to the holy city. Verse 15, altogether, for without, means outside, are dogs, that's religious leaders who are not saved. Sorcerers, that word there is the same word for pharmaceia. That's the Greek word pharmaceia, which is also the same word for drugs, which is witchcraft. Drug taking is witchcraft. Whoremongers that are sexual sin, murderers, idolaters, and whosoever loves and makes a lie will all have their part in the lake of fire. The word of God says that. But we can be saved through the blood of Jesus. And if we confess our sin, say it with me, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Cigarette and tobacco smoking, you can be set free in the name of Jesus. Pornography, God can set you free from that. I want to speak quickly now about music. If you're into rock music, one of the most powerful forces in the world today is the rock music scene. And I want you to know that there are three parts to music. First of all, you have the melody. And then you have also the harmony. And then you have the beat. Now I've got something to say tonight. Some of you may not know, some of you younger people. Did you know that if you get melody, the tune, with no rhythm and no harmony, you'll finish up with depression. If you just listen to the melody by itself, it's depressing, particularly if it's in a minor key. Did you know that 80, over 80% 80 of rock music is in a minor key? When we were kids, we used to listen to songs in major keys. Minor keys these days, it's very, very sad. Is this thing on over here? Is this on, bro? It is, you know. Listen to this. Middle C. Father. Here's the son. E. That's the third note. The fifth note. That's the Holy Spirit. Put them all together. Beautiful harmony. We can all worship God. No trouble at all. The devil comes into the church. He makes people sad. In the dark ages, they all sang in a minor key. You remember the old church chants? Who can beat me at dominoes? You know, all that sort of <laughs> now what happened there? I'll show you. Watch this. This is what happened. Here it is again. Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now the second one in that, in that chord there is Jesus, the middle one. Now what we do for a minor key is we lower that half a tone, and this is what it sounds like now. I'm no longer feeling as good as I did a minute ago. <laughs> because I'm in a minor key now. This is the music of the dark ages. The church is sang like this. The Holy Spirit had flown out the window. But when the Holy Spirit comes back into the church, we can all worship again. Hallelujah! <laughs> if 
If you get all harmony with the melody distorted and the rhythm varied, these groups are very clever. They change the rhythm halfway through. They'll give you rebellion. And you'll find a lot of kids around today who are depressed. They are rebellious. And if you play mainly the beat and emphasize the beat, I'll tell you what you get out of that. Sensuality. You will become very sensuous and sexually orientated. And that's where the kids are mucking themselves up today. Now I want you to know there is a devil behind the rock music of today and if you listen to rock music you will destroy yourself. And my advice is to get out of it as fast as you can and start listening to good music that glorifies Jesus. And you need to go to the walls of your bedroom, take down all the posters with all those long-haired greasy fellas, consign them to the fireplace and put up nice pictures because the things you think about will actually form your character. Put up pictures of mountains and rivers and streams and horses and all sorts of nice stuff. And when you wake up in the morning, you see God's nature, you see. Very clever the way the devil's mucking people up today. You say, who's behind all this? I'll tell you, I discovered it in the Bible. Let's have a look. Revelation chapter 9. Did you know the rock groups of today, what do they look like? They've got men's faces on them, but they've got hair like women. Let's have a look at them, shall we? We're reading Revelation chapter 9. We're reading chapter two, verse 2. All together, Revelation chapter 9 and verse 2 about these locusts that come out of the bottomless pit. He opened the bottomless pit and there arose a smoke out of the pit. And then you'll see out of that smoke, verse 3, there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth and unto them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. Now what do these locusts look like? Let's read, shall we, verse 7 at the end of the verse. And their faces were as the faces of men, and they had hair as the hair of women. Did you know that the rock groups of today, many of them are into Satanism, and they actually yield themselves to a demonic spirit, and they play the music to actually catch the young people's souls. They go to hell, and they take the young people with them. And even the tapes they put out, they put in a hexagram, which is a witchcraft symbol. It's two triangles uh, intersecting one another like this, bisecting one another like this. There it is. And they put their, their, their tape in there and they dedicate it to Lucifer. And everybody who buys a copy of that tape from then on gets a personal spirit to come in, in their home with them. And you kids are buying their stuff and taking it home. No wonder you've got problems. I say you need to have a big burn up in the name of Jesus. Burn them with fire. Deuteronomy 7.25 The gods of their heathen shall ye burn with fire. Do you know I was having a meeting in the South Island one night. May all bear witness to this. In the middle of my meeting we had a guy that came in with one of these around his neck. It was the witchcraft one with a circle around it. The hexagram of the circle. And as the meeting progressed this thing began to spin around his neck on a, on a, on a cord. It spun around like this. Three times around his neck in the middle of my meeting. We had another lady in there with a ticky around her neck. It started to twist itself up in the meeting and almost strangled her in the meeting. I haven't got that much time tonight. We're trying to keep this on video. So I'm not giving you too much detail. I'm giving you the bones of this thing tonight. I want you to know the music will affect you greatly. And if you listen to good music, you'll be blessed. And if you listen to demonic music, you'll be ruined. In the name of Jesus, I say that. You say, well, can you give us an illustration. We were having meetings in a certain town one night. The meeting came to a conclusion, just as this one is in just a minute. And a young man came forward with all the others. I prayed for all the others and they went home. This young man said, I've been into all that stuff you've mentioned tonight. Don't let me go until I'm free. I said, okay. We started praying with him. He was lying on the floor. He started to wriggle like a snake. He was into everything. We got rid of all the stuff out of him. All these demon spirits went out of him. And then when it was nearly finished, I said, you're almost free. He looked a complete wreck. He was covered with blood. He'd been nicking himself with his fingernails and there was dirt all over the place. My clothes were a mess. I was, I was on the floor there just holding him, make sure he didn't get away. There was dirt everywhere. You've never seen such a horrible mess. He was spitting at me. There was blood. And it was almost finished. And I said to him, there's still some more devils in there. Not much. I said, name yourself. Who are you in the name of Jesus? Give me a name. And this devil called out, drums. And I said, I can't understand. Speak properly. Drums. D-R-U-M-S. Drums. I said to him later, after he got set free, I said, what do you know about drums? He said, I have been living in the African villages where they used to bring up the demons using a drum beat. That's how they bring him up. I never knew that before, and we cast that demon out in the name of Jesus. He was almost free. I said, there's one left. I don't know who it is. Do you know who it is? I said, name yourself in the name of Jesus. And this devil in him, like a king spirit, was binding him up, and he knew who he was, and he knew that I didn't know, you see. So he went like this. 
I said, you shut your mouth on me, will you? Well, I said, keep it shut. Don't tell me anything. I'll ask God. Thank you. In the Bible it says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who giveth liberally to all men and upbraideth not. I said, Father, give me wisdom, please. Who is the devil in here? And he told me. I knew his name straight away. And I looked at this fellow and I said, I know who you are. <laughs> and he went like this. You can see him trying to move away like a snake wriggling on his back across the floor. He said, you can't get away. I'm holding you down. I said, when I give you the word and I say your name, you've got to come out. Do you know that's where the power lies? You find the name of the devil and he's got to move in the name of Jesus. If you just say, devil, come out in the name of Jesus, he'll say to another devil nearby, he means you, not me. <laughs> but if you can say his name, he's bound to move in the name of Jesus. And I said, I know who you are. And so I said the name that God gave me. I never would have thought of this name in a hundred years, but God showed me what it was. I said, here we go. Apollyon, in the name of Jesus, set him free. And as soon as I said Apollyon, this fellow went into a sort of a fit, and he twisted, and the back of his head actually touched his heels down here. He bent backwards like that. I didn't think the human body could go in that direction. And I said to May, come and have a look at this. Look. <laughs> never seen anything like it in my life. The fellow looks like he's going to be snapped in half. And I knew because when Jesus cast out devils, they tried to destroy him, you see? Destroy the boy. And I said, you're trying to destroy this boy. I said, leave him alone in the name of Jesus. Let him go back. And his body flicked back and it had him by the throat. Now you're trying to strangle him, I said. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, Apollyon, when I give you the words, you'll come out and you'll go to the place of divine appointment. Apollyon, in the name of Jesus Christ, whom I serve, leave him now, go in Jesus' name. And immediately there was a terrible cry come out of his mouth. It was the most strange thing I've ever heard in all my days of preaching and setting people free. It went like this. Ah! And we heard it go right across the room. Ah! And it went right through the wall and away down the road. Ah! You could hear it away down the road. And he was set free in the name of Jesus. And I thought, he lay like a limp rag, you know, and he looked awful. I said, how do you feel? He said, terrible, thanks. <laughs> I said, get him a cup of tea, someone. So they took him in the back room, they got him a cup of tea. That's a good plan, cup of tea, sugar. And I said, that word Apollyon is in the Bible somewhere, love. I went into my Bible, I looked it up, and I found it in this chapter, Revelation chapter 9, and I found out who Apollyon is. Let's have a look at it. We're reading chapter 9 and verse 11. Read with me this most interesting verse. Here we go. This is the devil that drives the acid rock music, people. And this is the devil that controls your life if you listen to it. Let's read together. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue his name is Apollyon. And you look in the margin to find out what Apollyon means, and it means destroyer. That is one of the most powerful devils in the world today that drives the acid rock people. Destroyer needs to go in the name of Jesus. And all your music library needs to be changed and start listening to music that will glorify Jesus. If you fellows are interested in that, if you've got the long hair, you want to get it off too, have a good haircut, please. I'll tell you why. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 11 that any man who's got long hair, it's a shame to him. And the word shame in Greek is atima. I have a Greek son-in-law and he tells me that word atima means shame it's sort of got homosexual tendencies connected with it in Greek. Just get your hair off and just look like a normal man. Earrings are out for boys. Don't have any signs of homosexuality. These are an abomination before God. Just look like a man and God will bless you in Jesus' name. You say, with all that stuff you've given us tonight, Barry, are there any others? There's stacks of stuff. There's witchcraft, jewellery, there's hexagrams, there's... There's, there's all this witchcraft stuff like the unicorn's horn, there's the ank, the cross with a circle on top, anything like that you've been involved in, come out in Jesus' name and be set free. Tonight, Barry, you say, I'm not a Christian, I'd like to be born again. I'd like to pray for you people first. If you'd like to give your life to Jesus as a start and be thoroughly saved, I'd like you to get out of your seat and come to the Lord tonight and say, Lord, I recognize that when you died on that cross, you died to save a sinner like me. And as you come tonight, you're going to ask him to save you and you will be saved by the power of God. Do you know, I thank the Lord I'm saved. Anybody else glad they're saved? This is not something I'm just saying at the end of a meeting. This is something that really enthuses me. You say, why are you so happy to be saved? Because I almost died a couple of years ago. Almost died a couple of years ago, friends. I've been on my deathbed. The old man who was lying next to me in the same room died at three o'clock in the morning and he shouted, No! And then he shouted again, No! And then he said once more, 
No, and I knew where he'd gone. I couldn't get to him. I'd had a heart attack. I was like a, a motor car with a motor that had gone bung. And I just couldn't turn over in bed. I heard him screaming next to me, No! And the Lord allowed me to hear someone dying next to me and I couldn't get to him. I tell you what, I said, Lord, if you get me off this bed, as long as I've got breath, I'll tell the people, turn to Jesus. Stop your religious fanaticism. Stop your religious ideas. Get to Jesus. Flee to Christ. And be born again properly by the power of God. You say, Barry, I want to get saved tonight. I'm not a real Christian. I'd love to be saved. Come to the cross tonight. Ask Jesus to save you. Up the front here, we're going to pray the sinner's prayer. Here it is. Lord Jesus, I repent of my sin. I'm sorry for the way I've gone. Number two, I believe you died for me, Jesus. Lord, I love you. Thank you. Your blood covers my sin. I love you for that, Lord. And tonight, I'm not ashamed. I'm going to receive Christ in front of these people. And the Bible says, to as many as receive him, he gives them power to become the sons of God. If you receive Jesus tonight, you will become a son of God. And I'd like you to come with a friend. We're going to sing that lovely song, Amazing Grace. And if you come with a friend, we will pray right along the front with all those who come. And then later on, we're going to set people free in the name of Jesus from all that stuff we talked about tonight. And God will bless you richly in the name of the Lord. Let's pray, shall we, as the musicians come now. Dear Father in heaven, we bless you for the cross of Calvary. We thank you that it was at the cross Jesus paid the price for us and set us free. Let the people move now and let them be saved in the lovely name of Jesus we pray. Bless that man, bless that woman. And let them have a lovely experience of Christ tonight we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You, you know who you are if you've never had this experience. You move to the front right now and we will see. Let's stand, shall we, in the name of the Lord. Welcome to the family of God tonight. Amen. Hold the music for a minute. We're going to ask those who are a little nervous about coming. God bless you, dear. Come with a friend. Turn to the person next to you and say, please come with me and somebody will come with you. There's nothing wrong with doing that. We're not here to embarrass. We're here to help you in Jesus' name. I'm a very kind fellow. I promise you that. You just move a little closer to here and we can pray with you in just a minute. Okay, verse 2. And just ask someone near you, please come with me. You say, I can't get out. Yes, you can. People will move as you make your way to Jesus tonight. Here we go. Verse 2. Twas grace with those who are here. Anybody who's here, I will pray with tonight. After the meeting, it's too late. I'm sorry. We do it here. This is where people get saved. If you're coming tonight, please come now. God will bless you in Jesus' name. Counselors, come too, please. God bless those who are coming tonight. That's lovely. Anybody else? It's your own will, you see. It's your will. You will come if you want to. Let's hum a verse. Mm -hmm.
God bless you who have come. Congregation, be seated, please. We'll hold the music. Would you just look at me tonight, dear ones, please? Those watching on video, this is the prayer of salvation. I want you to answer me with the word yes, if this is what you're doing tonight. God bless you for coming. I'm going to repent of my sin. I'm coming to Jesus tonight. I believe he died for me. And tonight I'm going to receive him deep within my heart. And I'm going to start the Christian life as from tonight. Is that what you're doing? Would you say yes, please? Yeah. Let's just bow in prayer. Get ready for the prayer. Talk to Jesus, but don't talk to me. Those watching the video, you pray this prayer with these people and be saved by the power of God. Here we go. Talk to the Lord now. Counselors, help them. Lord Jesus Christ. I come to you tonight because I am a sinner. Tonight, Lord Jesus, I repent of my sin. I turn away from my sin and I turn to Jesus. I believe, dear Lord, you died for me. Your blood covers my sin. And I thank you tonight. I open the door to my heart. Come in, Lord Jesus. Wash me and cleanse me. Make me your child as I receive you now by faith. I close the door with Jesus inside. Help me to live for you every day until you come again. I thank you, Lord Jesus. Tonight I have received you in the presence of these witnesses and you have received me. I love you and praise you for saving me tonight. Dear Father, in Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Keep your eyes closed. Hear the promise again. Listen to as many...